So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for participating in Girl Scouts of Colorado's webinar with the Census Bureau today. My name is Amy Artzer and I'm the Community Partnerships Manager for Girl Scouts of Colorado. Um, like I said, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's exciting that we have Girl Scouts on this webinar from all across the nation. So everybody to this awesome opportunity. We are going to keep everybody on mute for the duration of the webinar and we will be using the chat box to answer any questions. So um, I will be reading out questions later during our open Q&A. Um, I would love if everybody can say where they're from. It's very cool to see folks on here from all over the nation. I do want to remind folks that we are Girl Scouts, so please keep everything that you enter into the chat box appropriate. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Nick Schwartz from the U.S. Census Bureau. Nick is going to be presenting some awesome information to us um, about the census. And then, like I said, we will have time for a Q&A session. And then we'll take some time to go over Girl Scouts of Colorado's Stand and Be Counted patch and how, um, how you can go about getting that patch no matter where in the country you are. So welcome, Nick. All right, uh, Amy, just doing a quick sound test. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Well, <laughs> then I'm going to assume everybody else can. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I really want to thank Amy and Girl Scouts of Colorado for inviting me to speak to you all today about a very important subject, and that is the 2020 census, in case you hadn't guessed. Uh, as Amy said, my name is Nick Schwartz. I am a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau. My job is to educate people in the community about the census, so I hope you learned something today. So first off, let's answer this question. What is the 2020 census? The 2020 census counts every person living in the United States and its five territories, which are Puerto Rico, American Samoa, the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and the US Virgin Islands. Many of you have heard of a survey, I assume. Well, the census is a survey that goes out to every household in the country and its territories. On the survey, we ask questions such as, how many people live in the household? And is the home rented or owned? Then for each person who lives in the household, we ask their name, their age, their sex, their race, and their ethnicity. Each of these questions is really important when it comes to figuring out certain funding, and we ask every question for a specific reason. Why do we do this? Well, because the Founding Fathers wanted us to. The count is mandated by the Constitution and conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. Article 1, Section 2 says that we have to count everyone living in the United States once every 10 years. That is a mission for our country. And our mission includes counting everyone once, only once, and in the right place. The first census was done in 1790 when George Washington was president. Things looked very different back then. For one thing, there were a lot fewer people. We had only 17 states and a population of less than 4 million for the whole country. Back then, New York City was the largest city with a population of 33,131. Today, we have a population of close to 330 million. New York City is still our largest city, but it has a population of 8,622,357. In 1790, government workers went out on horseback to count everyone. Today, thanks to modern technology, horses are no longer necessary. You can respond online, by phone, or by mail. Okay, I know what you're thinking, big deal. Counting everyone is not easy though, and it's important. Let's watch this short video to learn why it's so important to get an accurate count. It's all about power and money. Almost $700 billion per year. And it only happens once every 10 years. It directly impacts our representation in government and the money that goes to our communities. Our schools. Our housing. Our neighborhood programs. Our lives. 
So what is it? The census. A population count of America. But it's much more than that. It's the basis of distributing power and money. From the government to our communities. The unfortunate part is that a lot of us aren't counted. And it's on us to change that. When we aren't counted, our communities don't get their Sorry about that. For each person not counted, their community loses out on over $20,000 over 10 years. For a household or a family of five, that community loses out on over $100,000. But we can change it. When the census comes in the mail, fill it out. Don't throw it out. Or do it online. And make sure to count everyone in the household. Little ones too. Little ones too. The census begins in 2020. Most households will get a postcard in the mail next March telling them it's census time. And we're required to fill it out. The counts will be used to determine how many congresspersons each state gets. And to draw new congressional maps in 2021. It's also used to draw maps for basically every level of government. From the state legislature to school boards. So this is a huge opportunity for us. To make a direct impact on our communities. It's critical that we are all counted. So go ahead, take the pledge. Pledge to be counted. Pledge to be counted. Pledge to be counted. Because there's too much at stake not to. I count. I count. I count. I count. I count. We count. Contamos. We count. We count. We count. We count. We count. So even though that video is not was not produced or created by the 2020 census officially, they are still a partner of ours. And I really love that video because it's really, it captures what America looks like in the year 2020 and then why it's so important for all of us to get counted. So I hope you will take the pledge with me in pledging to count yourself and everyone living with you in the 2020 census. So that video highlighted some pretty important reasons why the census matters. And another one is shown on this map. The blue dots show where Americans live. You can see that the eastern half of the country is much more dense than the western half. By counting everyone living in the United States, we can understand where people live and how they move around the country over time. Your responses to the 2020 census are used to figure out how many representatives each state gets in the House of Representatives in Washington, DC. Right now, Colorado has seven congressional seats. Many officials are hopeful that if we get a complete and accurate count, and I should stress only if we get a complete and accurate count, we might gain a seat, which would give us additional representation in Washington. For those of you in other states, do you know how many congressional seats your state has? Find out and put your answer in the chat box. Your responses to the census are also used to figure out how much money each state gets from the federal government for public services like roads, schools, hospitals, libraries, and so much more. So here's how you and your parents can respond by going online to 2020census.gov, by phone, by calling 844-330-2020, by mail, where you will receive a paper form and you can mail it back to us when you're done, or you can wait for a census taker to come to your door. And get counted any of these ways by August 14th. We also have the census available in 12 other languages online and over the phone. Maybe some of you speak one of these languages. For those who choose to fill out the census online, the, each of these languages will be available on the bottom of the screen. When you click that language, the entire window will flip into that language. Over the phone, each language has its own dedicated phone number. When you call the number, the person will greet you in that language. For those who choose to fill out the census by paper form, you can request it in, an, in another language if you do not speak one of the languages listed. 
Finally, I want you to know that your information is kept private, which means we won't share it with anyone for any reason. The US Census Bureau is bound by law to protect your answers and keep them strictly confidential. In fact, every employee, including me, takes an oath to protect your personal information for life. I wanna show you some fun examples of the types of data we collect. On the left, you'll see some fun facts about Colorado. In 1900, we had only 539,000 people in the whole state. That's less than the number of people who live in Denver today. On the right, you can see some things like how many ice cream stores we have. This information is really important for local lawmakers to figure out what types of services their communities need. Sorry guys, having a little bit of difficulty getting this. For those of you in a different state, I have put a link in the chat box to a fun map. Click on your state and put your favorite fun fact in the chat box. Here you can see how much Colorado has grown between 2010 and 2018. How many boys and girls are there in your age group? Below, you'll see how people get to work. The vast majority, about 75%, drive alone. And I wanna show you a, a couple of other cool maps that illustrate the power of census data. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, Amy, can you confirm really quickly that you can see the map on the screen? I can. Great, thank you. So this map shows where the, uh, what's called population density. So it shows where there are the highest concentrations of people living in a given area. So if you can see down here, the lighter the color, the less people there are in per square mile. And if it gets towards darker green and then blue, that means there's a lot of people living in that area. Uh, so for those of you who have studied geography, you will probably know that we have a lot of people living on the coasts. So uh, people in the Northeast, in the New York City, Washington DC area, and then people living in the West Coast, in California, uh, up all the way up through Seattle while the middle of the country is relatively um, open, there's not, is, is not as dense in terms of number of people. Uh, and then on the right panel over here, you can see some really fun facts like which states have the oldest populations. Maine has the oldest population on average um, at 44.3, while Utah is the youngest. You can see things like average family size. This is pretty funny because the Utah and Maine are flipped here. So Utah has the largest average family size and Maine has the smallest. And then highest and uh, lowest median incomes, so which people make the most money uh, for their jobs based on where they're living. So that is one really cool map. And then this is another one. This one shows like our population distribution, which is kind of like what I showed you earlier. So again, here the blue represents where people are. So you can see the middle of the country is not nearly as dark as the eastern half, um, particularly, but even on the west coast, again, the same thing. Um, so, but if you were to cut the United States in half, east and west, the eastern half is significantly more dense than the western half. Um, you will also see where people of a particular race live in the country. So if you wanna see where the most American Indians live or where the most African Americans live or where the most, uh, Asian Americans live, or where the most Latinos live. Um, you can use this, and this is very powerful illustrations for people who need to make important decisions about what services to provide. Uh, and so these are just a couple of really cool illustrations. So now let me switch back over to my presentation. So hang on one second.
So the last thing I want to show you is how we're doing so far. Uh, as of yesterday, Colorado has a self-response rate of 54.7%, which means over half of households have already responded. Here you will see the rankings within Colorado by county. Douglas County is leading the way, so if you live in Douglas, give yourself a pat on the back. For those of you not in Colorado, I have put a link in the chat box to our interactive map. How is your state doing? Finally, and you must surely be wondering how Colorado is doing compared to the whole country. Well, the national response rate is 51%, which means we just broke our 50% mark for the whole country, which means more than half of Americans have responded to the census, which is great. And Colorado is doing almost four percentage points better than the country as a whole. And we are 11th in the country at 54.7. Minnesota is leading at 60.9%. And uh, so if you're from Minnesota, congratulations, you're currently winning the race. For those of you in other states, how is your state doing compared to the national average? So while half of Americans have responded to the census, that means the other half has not. That's a lot of people. I need your help reaching them. If you want to do more as a partner with the 2020 census, complete the patch program or go to this website to learn more. If you haven't filled out your census yet, grab a parent and fill it out. Tell your friends, your family, neighbors, fellow Girl Scouts, classmates to get counted in the 2020 census. And with that, I hope this was helpful and that you learned something. And uh, Amy will tell us if we have time for some questions. Thanks, Nick, so much. That was super interesting information. Um, so now we have some time for a lot of questions, if you have them, for Nick about the U.S. Census. And I also want to take this time to just remind everybody to please make sure that you're using the chat box for questions about the U.S. Census or responses to some of the questions that we're asking during the census. Um, okay, so first person asked, do you, how do you know when you're waiting to get census responses if we're waiting to count people? So I'm just gonna rephrase that question a little bit is that how do you, if we don't have necessarily have an accurate count of people right now, which is why we're doing the census, how do you know what the response rates are? That's a good question. So we go off of uh, population estimates that come out every year, um, both between uh, census, census data that we do. So when, um, we do this census every 10 years, and uh, in between each census, we are doing surveys that go out to a certain number of people, not everybody. And then based on those responses, as well as uh, state governments coming out with population estimates, we kind of, kind of combine all of that together to come up with what we think is the current population count, and that's how we get a population estimate um, based on what we think the growth has been since the last census. Great. All right, lots of great questions coming in. So I'm just gonna scroll back a little bit. If somebody fills out a paper census form, how long does it take to process it and get them counted? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, I don't know, but I, I can certainly find that out. Um, I don't think it is very long, depending on the mail. And once it gets there, we have two national processing centers uh, one is in Indiana and the other is in Arizona. So I assume depending on where you live, that will determine which one it goes to. Uh, and then we have big machines that read the census uh, responses that you fill out. Uh, and so then that is how it gets processed. Um, so I would imagine within a span of a couple of weeks, you should have yourself counted. Great. How do homeless people participate in the census? Ah, great question. So. For people who are experiencing homelessness, uh, we have several different procedures that we can use. Um, our main one is that we work with we work with homeless shelters, with food pantries, and soup kitchens, and churches, and other places of worship uh, to um, come up with a time where we can send a census taker to come there and count everyone there. Uh, and so that is called a service-based enumeration which is a really fancy word for counting. Um, but we do, we do do more than just count one, two, three, four. We do take some of that basic information like I showed you at the beginning. So we say enumeration. 
um, that is service based. Now, if there is a if there are people who do not use any of those services, um, we have uh, also census takers who are trained to find out where they are and um, pick a day to go there into like a park, for example, uh, and count them living there. Uh, and their address in that case would just be wherever they are. And that's true whether they're in a uh, homeless shelter or a church or if they're just at a park, um, that would be their address. Uh, we would just use cross streets. Um, they do also have the ability to go to a library uh, and go to a computer and count themselves at the library. Um, that is not as preferred for us because it's a little less accurate uh, in terms of where they are and spending most of their time. Uh, but that is an additional option for them if they if they choose to do that. Great. Um, here's a question. So with everybody social distancing, what is the census doing to make sure everyone in Colorado and everyone across the nation is being counted? And are there any special measures being put into place? Um, to adapt to our current social distancing situation? Yeah, good question. Um, the good news is, is that because the census is online and over the phone, it has never been easier to get counted. So uh, the social distancing hasn't impacted the majority of people in that way because you don't need to interact with anybody uh, to get counted in the census. Um, we have the Census Bureau nationwide has suspended all field operations until June 1st. Um, in accordance with federal and state health officials and guidelines. So that is our priority in making sure that we keep the public and our own employees safe. Uh, but we also uh, are fortunate that we have these, ability, these options for the public to count themselves in the census. Um, there are certain people who, if they do not have a physical mailing address that's, a not, that's not a PO box um, that uh, the post office can't get to, um, they have a different way of getting counted, and um, that is something that uh, we need to wait for our field operations to get back up and running before they can receive their packet of information. Um, so that is really the only thing that has been affected, uh, and so we are doing everything, taking every precaution and making sure we are working with everyone to spread awareness and um, tell them they can uh, go ahead and go online and get counted as well, if they can do that. Great. So I know you answered this during um, your presentation, Nick, but maybe we could go over this again. So how do people know that their information is safe when they fill out their census? Yeah, um, sure. Let me go back to that slide here. Confidentiality. So we have uh, federal laws that protect your information. Uh, and for those of you who want to study our uh, codes and our laws, if you go to Title 13, uh, they tell you in there that the census is prohibited, not, not allowed, to share any person's data with any government agency or any individual for any reason at all. Uh, that means it cannot be used in a, in a court, it can't be used um, by immigration, it can't be used by police officers. Um, nobody is allowed to see or touch the data except for census employees um, on a work-related basis only. Uh, and when you submit your data, however you choose to, either online, by phone, or by mail, uh, your data goes uh, one direction directly into a vault uh, and stays there. So then uh, it only comes out in aggregate form, which means it only comes out at a very high level. So we have no way of knowing who is who. It will come out for a particular area and say, here's how many people live in this state. Here's uh, what percentage are male and what percentage are female. Here is the average age. Here is the percentage of people who, um, who are white. Here's a percentage of people who are Latino. Here's a percentage who are African American. Uh, and so that has no way of matching up to some specific data. Uh, and then we also have a number of measures to ensure security on the internet. Um, so I'm happy to get into that more specifically if somebody has a question, if we have any real computer experts or um, tech experts on the phone, uh, I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but there are really strict measures in place. And then I also mentioned the oath that every employee takes. 
So when I started working for the census uh, almost a year ago, I was sworn in on the Constitution to protect anyone's data that I see and to serve the mission of the census. And if you see on the screen there, if I wanted to or chose to break that oath, um, I could go to prison for five years and have to spend, have to pay $250,000. So it's a really hefty fine. Uh, and so it's something that's designed to really prevent anybody from giving away that information. Wow. Great information. So um, I'm going to go back through some of these questions. And again, I really want to remind people to please keep the chat box for questions about the census and questions for Nick. Um, so bear with me one moment while I scroll back. So I think the question has come up a few times and maybe this just wasn't super clear before. So how does somebody like, how are you prompted to fill out the census? And I could answer from my perspective and what my experience, because this was the first time I got to fill out the census for me and my household this year, but how do you, how are you prompted to fill out the census? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Amy, why don't you share uh, your experience and how you did it, and then I can add to that. Sure, great. So I, I actually saw a, um, a few commercials about the census and was excited about filling it out. Like I said, this was the first time that I filled it out for me and my household um, as a young adult now. And I actually got a postcard in the mail. So the postcard came to the current resident of my household. So they didn't necessarily know who was living here, but I filled it out for everyone who's living in my home. So I filled it out for me, my husband, and our five-month-old daughter. So even though she's just a baby, I counted her as part of um, our household. So it was pretty cool for me to be able to do that. And I do know that, um, like I said, I've seen a lot of commercials, and heard about other ways um, and seen kind of ads when I'm browsing on the internet about the census. So I think that's how people are prompted to do it. And people should know that they're only filling it out once. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so, so, so glad that uh, you were able to have that experience uh, counting yourself and your uh, husband and newborn together. Um, so that's, uh, it's a pretty cool experience because it's something you only do every 10 years. Um, so it's not very often. Um, I will just add to that that um, if you, in addition to seeing commercials and advertising online, um, we also sent uh, for the majority of the country, um, everybody got an invitation to respond in the mail starting middle of March. Um, and so we've been live, if you will, for about a month, a little over a month, uh, and we've sent several reminders. Uh, so for the majority of the country, about 95% of you have been getting invitations to respond, uh, inviting you to go online or to call, and there are instructions in that mail. Now, if you've been throwing them away or if you haven't gotten them or seen them for any reason, don't worry about it. Uh, you can still just go online right now or at some point soon uh, and go, just go to 2020census.gov uh, and you will see in clear, uh, there'll be clear uh, buttons there that you can click that says take, take the census or get or respond now. Uh, and then it's really easy. Um, Amy can probably attest it probably only took you, what, like 10 minutes, Amy? Uh, that is generous. I feel like it was really quite fast. Yeah. So it depends on how many of you are in the house, of course. Um, but for, yeah, for yourself and maybe a couple others living in there, it would take maybe a little over five minutes. Um, so some awesome still questions coming in. And I let everyone know, we're going to try to make sure that all the questions in the chat box are answered. So just bear with us while we go through them. But definitely a question that come, has come up a few times is that why is the census only every 10 years? Um, well, uh, that's just what uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, that's just what they decided was a good frequency. Uh, if you remember, if you go back to our Constitution slide here, all the way back, uh, it's in this part of the Constitution that they say we will do a count every 10 years. And so since that's what they decided back in the 1780s, uh, that is what we have done ever since. So starting in 1790, every 10 years ever since, uh, we have held the census because I guess that's what they decided. It was a good amount of time in between. Uh, and so it makes it really easy when we do it on the, on the, zero, on the even 10-year even marks. So it's really easy to keep track. Um, and that's just what they felt would be a good a good amount of time to do. 
Um, okay, so also, Nick, could you quickly go back to the um, slide with the phone number for filling out for yeah. census over the phone? I know some folks were looking for that number again. Absolutely. Great, cool. Um, okay, so let me go back through these questions here. Um, are there accommodations for somebody with disabilities to complete the census? So maybe perhaps if you are deaf or blind, um, how do we accommodate that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, for folks who are, uh, who are blind, I would just encourage them to use the phone option. Um, I did a presentation for one of our, uh, for the Colorado Coalition for the Blind a few months ago. Uh, and they were really excited that they had a phone option this time because they were used to having to do it um, the paper form and they had to wait to get a braille version. Now we do still have that option as well uh, where um, they can still request it in braille if they would rather do it that way. And then for those who are deaf, I would tell them to uh, go online. And if they don't have access to a computer, um, or the internet, they can easily, they can hopefully get somewhere where they can. Uh, and if not, they can always wait for the paper form and, and do it that way. Uh, and then in general, for folks with other disabilities, um, I know we do have here in Colorado, a partnership with our state relay, um, where I think we have accommodations in place for some disabilities that way. Um, and then uh, if you have any other specific questions, it's hard to answer without getting into specifics. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with you if you have a specific concern. Um, and then what if you are currently pregnant? How do you fill out the census? Ah, great question. Taking your uh, new upcoming new baby into consideration. So technically it's whoever is around on April 1st. That is our kind of reference day. That is traditionally Ben census day. Um, now, like if, so you're supposed to go off of whoever is uh, if the baby is born April 1st or before, then they can, um, they can go ahead and count the baby then. Um, now it's, I don't recommend it because sometimes there are surprises with pregnancies where you're expecting a boy and you get a girl or vice versa. Um, or the, you know, the birth is actually delayed a little bit um, or comes a little bit early. So there are just some certain unexpected things that can happen. So I don't encourage folks to kind of predict and count their baby before they've been born. But if they know that the baby for sure is going to be born, say before August 14th, up until they have the ability to count the baby, um, I tell them to wait and fill it out uh, when <clears throat> once the baby is born. Now, if you know for sure that your uh, baby's not gonna be born until the fall, uh, then, I, then I can tell you, then you just, you just won't count the baby uh, for this census. Um, I, was, I was actually, that, that happened to me. I was born on a census year. And, uh, and I was born in the fall of that census year, so I wasn't counted. I had to wait until I was 10 years old before I was counted in my first census. Wow, that's a great yeah. bit. Um, okay, so some more questions. Can you um, tell if somebody fills out the census more than once? We can. Uh, we have several different procedures for quality control. Uh, so if somebody accidentally or on purpose, because there are those, unfortunately, those people out there, um, if we get something that we really think is a duplicate, we have process, a process in place where we can say this is a 90% chance of being a duplicate because the answers are almost identical. Um, and then we have a ways of following up. So when you fill out the census, we ask you for your phone number, and that is the reason why. Um, we are not gonna be spamming you um, or you know, sending you a bunch of junk and marketing calls. I assure you, we have better things to do. Um, but the reason we ask for your phone number is in case we are concerned that there is either just a duplicate possibility or we have a question about something you filled out. Like, are there really 25 people living in this house? Um, maybe the answer is yes. Um, but some, something like that. So we have ways of following up with you just in case we're concerned that there's um, either a duplicate or uh, some other uh, questions with the data. Great. Um, okay, so how, what is the best way to encourage young people to fill it out as someone who is young and wants to help adults be more responsible? So I think this is a super awesome question. Um, yeah, so what can, you know, most Girl Scouts are not um, the head of their household or not living alone. And they're, you know, 
with other adults. So as a young Girl Scout, how can they encourage other people to be filling out the census? Well, uh, that's a, such a great question, and I'm really thankful for whoever asked it, and I hope that, uh, I hope that you will walk away from this feeling ready to go uh, tell some people why it matters. Um, I think the, the most important thing, um, well, there's several things. Um, number one, I think, is the, the urgency. Um, someone asked why we only do it every 10 years, and I said it's because the Constitution says so. Um, and so because of that, we only do it every 10 years. So for those of you, you know, if you're, if you're nine or 10 years old right now, you're gonna be in college by the next time, next time we do this. That's a really long time. Uh, and so you need to really tell the person to say, I need you to care about my future because this is something that's going to impact me and you for the next 10 years. Um, this is everything to do with like what, um, how much, how much money my school is going to have so that I get a good education. Um, this is going to impact my ability to get good health care if I need to go see a doctor. Um, this is going to affect um, my, my representation in government so that I know that I have people who are fighting for my interests as I get older and start entering the workforce and entering the world. Um, we need to make sure that we have money for our libraries so that they can um, continue to be a great community resource for everyone. So this is really about caring, you know, caring for your future and making sure that your community, and I don't just mean the United States, I don't just mean Colorado or California or Minnesota. I'm talking about all the way down to your neighborhood and your, your, your town or your city. This is, this is money that comes all the way in at the local level uh, and helps and impacts so many things. Uh, and so that's, that's what I would uh, tell you to have you appeal to adults who are maybe not supportive of the idea. Um, so I hope that is helpful. Great. Um, and towards the, in our last few minutes of this webinar, we will go over the Girl Scouts of Colorado Stand and Be Counted patch, which I also think is a great uh, thing for girls to go through the activities and earn. Um, and there's some tips in there for how you can engage with adults um, and encourage them to be filling out their census. Um, okay, so some more questions. So the census asks your sex. So what if you don't identify as male or female? Great question. Um, first of all, I will say that it is self-identifying, so you do not have to select the, uh, your biological gender. You may choose to identify with whichever you choose. Um, if you don't identify with either, you can just leave it blank. Uh, we obviously want to collect as much information as we can because, like I said, um, that all that information is really important when we're trying to figure out um, funding for services that are maybe specific to men or women. Um, however, uh, it is not going to prevent prevent you from submitting your the rest of your answers um, if you if you don't identify as male or female and would like to just leave it blank. That is completely fine. Great. Okay, and so again, I'm gonna ask everybody, I feel like we've asked several times now to please keep the chat box um, for questions related to the census only. And if folks continue to put other things in the chat box, we will just remove you from the webinar so that we can keep it really focused um, for the folks who want to learn about the census. Additionally, I see somebody put a, um, a file, a JPEG into the chat box. Please don't click that. Um, all right, so we'll make sure that folks keep getting their questions answered. Um, what happens if you have more than one family living in a house? Uh, then you count everybody. Um, the the instruct the um, when you're filling out the census, you want to count every single person living in your household. So they don't even have to be related to you. If they're living with you um, for any period that's more than temporary. Um, then you need to count them. So um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you some uh, hypothetical examples here. So if um, if my if my brother decided to come visit uh, and he was just coming to see me for a week and then went back home, um, I would not count him because he's just coming for a quick visit. Um, now, say he lost his job and he needed a place to stay for a while until he got back on his feet he can't come to stay with me for six months and is sleeping on my couch, I would count him. Um, or this would be true if instead of my brother, it's my friend. Um, if my friend is staying with me 
and um, he doesn't have a place to go for six months and has, you know, just trying to get on his feet, I would count him. Um, so you would count anybody living in your household. It doesn't matter. You can say there's anywhere from one to 99 people living in your household. And then you have to fill out that information for every single person. Um, so we, it doesn't really matter how many number of families are living in there because that's actually, um, that can be very common and, and um, frequent that we have multiple generations living in one household. So then you would count um, grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, Sally and Bill, and uh, baby and baby Jim. So you would count everybody. And then if there were aunts and uncles there too, I mean, you would count everybody or a friend, like I said. So you count everybody. Um, somebody asked a really wonderful question and I know um, this will be especially interesting for people in Colorado, but how um, does being in the military impact the numbers? So if you're in the military, not living at home, how do mm -hmm. you count it in the census? Yeah, good question. Um, the military has their own procedures for counting. So they fall into a, a totally unique category. They're very much their own thing. Um, and as kind of a um, sister agency, if you will, within the federal government, uh, we sort of have an understanding with them in terms of how they're going to be reporting their data. So if there's um, anyone, anyone who's on active duty who's living on a military base, and that includes, that actually goes for anywhere in the world, uh, because any, U any military base is considered American territory. Uh, and so anyone living on a military base anywhere in the world will be counted in their own way. So they don't need to go online um, or call or they don't, need to, they don't need to respond themselves. Like they'll be getting counted by somebody within the military. Great. And then this is a, kind of a similar question, but how do people living in college dorms get counted? Yeah, good question. Uh, similar to the military, um, they they actually have a category that's called group quarters. Uh, and so this, is, this applies to anyone in a college dorm, uh, in a prison, or in a senior home. Um, we work with an administrator or someone in charge of the facility who provides um, all of that data to us. Uh, so in the same way, we don't want someone to go online or call or respond themselves. Great. And I know this question, oh, see, it just came up and we, I was just about to read it. How did the census get its name? And oh if you don't know the answer, it came up earlier in the chat box, so I took a minute to look it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to know the etymology. I'm guessing it's Latin. It sure is. So it is Latin. It comes from, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this because I'm not great at Latin, but I think the, how you say it is sincere. C yeah, sensere, yeah. S E R E, which means to assess. Yep, so there's your answer. Yeah, so that really makes a lot of sense. But if that doesn't make sense to you, because I'm not the best at explaining these types of things, I definitely just recommend Googling origin of the word census. Um, and I think because we've had such great questions today um, and some great sharing of links. I will send a follow-up email to everybody who signed up for the webinar today, just with some follow-up links so that you can go explore the maps um, and look at your state's um, response rate so far. And just for funsies, I'll include the official origin of the word census so that everyone can read through it themselves. Um, but somebody asked also, what if you don't receive something in the mail to complete your census? What do you do then? Uh yeah, so it's possible either, um, if it's possible you don't live in an area that receives um, mail from the post office, um, that's like at a physically, that's in a, in a mailbox tied to a physical address. Uh, and if that's the case, you also fall into a different category. Uh, and that has, that is the area that has been impacted uh, by coronavirus um, since we've suspended our field operations. So if you have a way to access a computer um, or if you want to call this number on the phone, you can just go ahead and count yourselves that way. Um, so I guess that, that's true really of, any, of anybody, um, regardless of where you live. Um, if you haven't received anything in the mail and have not responded yet, feel free to do any of these options, um, either with the online or over the phone. Um, if you don't have that ability and you live in one of these um, rural or remote areas that does not have um, regular mail, a city-style address, 
um, then you will just have to wait and sit tight until uh, we resume our operations in June. Uh, and then hopefully we should be able to get a packet to you shortly after that. And I, I apologize for the delay, but uh, there's just <laughs> nothing, nothing we can really do about it. Nothing, no one saw this coming. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think though, and correct me if I'm wrong though, so my understanding is if you haven't received anything to complete your census, you can always just go online to this website or call the phone number listed here and complete it that way. So that if you haven't been prompted to complete the census yet, you're being prompted now. So go ahead and go to the website or call the phone number, right? Yeah. Uh, just make sure you have uh, everyone in your household together because um, we don't want to get um, we don't want to get a uh, response just from uh, Tom and then not get one from Jane. So um, we want to make sure everybody is listed on the same household. So we don't want to be getting multiple multiple responses for one house. Great. But yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. So are there any other? Um, big kind of looming questions that folks have. I'm going back through the chat box to try and make sure that we answered everything. And I think we went, we did a pretty good job. Um, all right, so I don't see any other questions and don't see any other questions coming in through the chat box. So I think right now we're gonna take um, just a minute or two to show you the Scouts of Colorado Stand and Be Counted patch. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. So this is the Girl Scouts of Colorado webpage. I'll include the link here in our follow-up email as well. But if you go over to our program and then ways to participate, we have this great Girl Scouts at Home page. And right down here under council patches, we have our stand and be counted patch. So you can download the patch booklet. And again, I'll send out the link to this. But this is um, a great program, patch program for Girl Scouts. Anywhere in the country can participate in this. The steps are to learn more about the census, explore older census results, which is super interesting. Take your own census in your community, take the lead in your household and spread the word. So here are you, we walk you through the steps and then there are some great resources um, for you to explore. There are some awesome activities designed just for kids to learn more about the census. Um, and then down here is what the actual patch looks like. So you can order this patch. Um, you can order it through the Girl Scouts of Colorado shop. Unfortunately, our shop is closed at the moment and the physical patch is not yet in stock. However, we are maintaining a list, an email list of folks who are interested in ordering the patch when it becomes available. So if you, and I will include these instructions in a follow-up email, but if you are interested in ordering this patch, you can just email retail at gscolorado.org and say, please add me to the list for this patch. And then once the patch is available and our shop is fulfilling orders again, they will send you an email. So I hope everyone found that interesting. It is a great patch program. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you are um, in Colorado or in another state, uh, you can always earn this patch and still get it from Colorado. And let me just go back to our chat box to make sure that there are any additional questions coming through. Okay. Okay, so for step three, let me go back to this. Step three, somebody asked a question if we can't see people for step three. So you could, um, even though you can't see people, you could create a census and send it out. Um, maybe you're participating in school virtually and you could send it out to your classmates or you can share it with your Girl Scout troop. Um, as you know from this webinar, you can complete the census online. So if you're making your own census and gathering information about a group in your life, you can do it virtually as well. Um, and yes, I would say that we completed steps one and two of this patch through participating in this webinar. 
It's a great question. All right. Well, so I don't see any questions else questions coming through. Um, so like I said, I'll send a follow up email out to folks. Um, I really want to thank everybody for taking the time this afternoon to learn about the US Census. Um, I hope after you leave the webinar today, you go off and ask the folks living in your home if you've completed the census yet. And if not, go out and get your census completed. Um, I also really want to thank Nick from the Census Bureau for um, providing this awesome education to Girl Scouts, um, to Girl Scouts mostly in Colorado, but all over the country. Um, we really appreciate it and um, just want to thank you for all that you do and um, for everyone for learning a bit about the census today. Thank you all so much for joining. I hope you will take learn something today and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everybody.